House of the Dragon Season 2, Episode 2, Rhaenyra the Cruel, for me is a marked improvement over Episode 1. At first, I couldn't quite put my finger on why I enjoyed the episode so much more, but I think it became clearer on a rewatch. Two things really did stand out to me. The pacing was much better. I didn't feel like I was watching 73 minutes of TV, and it left me wanting more. Where episode one, in terms of the way it was edited, felt very jarring to me, and I had no desire to go back and rewatch it. The other thing I really picked up on in this episode in particular is the dialogue. In this episode, it was much more improved than episode one, with it seeming much more thought out and deliberate, with the right level of humour and tone. The dialogue in a lot of places in episode one sometimes came across very cheesy and ham-fisted, and it was much more compelling this week. We already knew the actors in this show are fantastic. They managed to take last week's mediocre script and elevate it with some of their performances. So when you give them good dialogue to work off, it's enchanting to watch. Near on every member of the main cast gave a 10 out of 10 performance, with even a lot of supporting cast nailing it. If there isn't some Emmy nominations for a few people this season, I will be shocked. But I'm not one to overly praise something. I try and take a balanced approach and I will give credit where it's due but I'm also not afraid to call out bad elements like I did with my review of episode one. What I tend to do when I write these reviews is I will watch the episode for the first time and write down a couple of pages of immediate reaction to it then I will re-watch the episode again but this time with my more book fan brain turned on and I will write a second separate review then merge the two together in the hopes it gives more of a balanced outlook and I don't let my book bias overshadow some great moments in the show that are fundamentally different from the book. As I have said in my review for A Son for a Son, while I found Blood and Cheese, well, simply okay, I think a lot of how people will remember it would come down to how they showed the aftermath in episode 2. If they skipped over much of the direct aftermath like they had done with Lucerus's death, it would damage Blood and Cheese more so than it already had been. I think for the most part, the scenes in the aftermath were done really well. Tom Glencarney was the heart of every scene he was in this week and really elevated the script with his performance. His performance was powerful. You can feel his rage, feel his loss, feel his wrath. It all carried over well into the small council scene where Egon is demanding a response. What I love about this small council scene, it really shows us what motivates the kind of men who seek the kind of power a seat on the small council would give you. How their first view of Jaehaerys' murder was not of grief or sadness for the loss of Egon and most of all Helena, but how they can actually use the murder of a child for political gain. You can very much see this in Otto's position when it comes to making a spectacle out of Jaehaerys' death and using it to damage Rhaenyra. But you can also see the coldness he views the situation with and the people involved. It really says a lot about Otto as a character and what drives him. The line that really stuck with me was Egon stating he didn't want his little son's body paraded through the street. Tom Glencarney nailed the delivery. I also really liked they didn't have Helena play the murder off like it was nothing and come across as slightly distant and uncaring, which is definitely a road they could have gone down. Fia Saban did a wonderful job at getting across a mother's not just grief at the loss of her child, but also the horror of the actual event itself. You can tell she is in shock, and the scene of her standing over Jaehaerys' bed and playing with his toys was really well done. Her sadness and reluctance changing into acceptance that she'll have to make a public display of her son's death is also a fantastic moment. The actual funeral itself was something I found very interesting to watch, which did catch me off guard a little bit. In the book, it said that the small folk loved Helena, and it was nice to see some semblance of that, even if it was them paying their respects after the loss of her child. Seeing the murder now be used in such a damaging political way for Rhaenyra was also fascinating to watch. You can of course hear about Rhaenyra the cruel aspect in the book, but it was interesting to hear how it developed and was used by Otto in such a way. When the cart carrying the body got stuck for a moment, I was sure the body was going to fly off, but what we got instead was by far one of the most accurate panic attacks they've ever seen portrayed in media before. While of course, the small folks surrounding the cart wish Helena well and just want to pay their respects, but you can see it slowly start to overwhelm her before it turns into sheer panic. I think someone on the production team, be that a writer, a director, or even Fia Saban herself, had to be drawing off some personal experience with these kinds of issues to be able to play it so convincingly. In all, one of my key takeaways from this episode that I'm really keen to see what they're going to do with Helena 
and how they're going to manage her declining mental health that ultimately leads to her final fate. I really did like the small council scene on Dragonstone and the air of tension as some of Rhaenyra's supporters question if she had a hand in child murder. You can really see here the impact the Rhaenyra the Cruel move had politically, even within her own court. With the immediate effect it's had Rhaenyra's position, it's damaged and weakened by it. I love Matt Smith in this scene because it tells you everything you need to know about Damon as a character without him even uttering a word, sitting back with a smirk, watching the chaos he unleashed start to unfold. It's also very telling that Rainey's clocks Damon's behaviour immediately and gives us an insight that given the fact that they grew up together, she perhaps is the only person in that room who truly understands the true nature of Damon. This is then followed by a fantastically acted scene between Rhaenyra and Damon, where both Matt Smith and Emma Darcy's chemistry shines through. It's the kind of argument you know had just been brewing under the surface for years, but until this point they were able to bury it and not address the elephant in the room. It now boiled over thanks to the tension that the war has brought, and they are forced to address Damon for what he is, the Rogue Prince, a man you would be a fool to wholly trust, no matter how much love or admiration you have for him. For me, this scene mirrors the throne room scenes during season one where Damon is exiled. Slowly over time, Viserys comes to accept Damon's true nature, and this scene for me shows Rhaenyra getting to that point as well. Oddly, Damon does half-heartedly apologise for what he did, and it did strike me as a bit odd the first time I watched the episode. But now I think about it, it does make sense, given it's clear he pushed Rhaenyra too far, and this was him trying to backpedal slightly. I also think this sets the groundwork for a possible reunion later in the season. Now Jason Baylor had a really nice scene where they talk about their fathers. What I did not expect was for Baylor and Jace to directly address Harwin Strong, given how volatile that whole situation is. I find it interesting that we get 100% confirmation that Jace is well aware that Harwin is his father, and it says a lot about his relationship with Baylor that she even feels comfortable addressing it, let alone Jace and entertaining the conversation. Now back in the council scene, Jace offers to keep an eye on King's Landing with his dragon, only for his mother to shoot down the idea, obviously wanting to protect her children's safety, given what's happened to Luke. But then, moments later, in private, she asks Baylor to go and do the very thing that she had deemed too dangerous for Jaehaerys to do. It does make me wonder if this is the start of the writers planting some of Rhaenyra's more questionable decisions, and this might progress slowly throughout the show, till we get to the point where she's just emotionally and mentally broken. I'm I'm not sure what to make of Aemon this episode. His scene in the aftermath of Blood and Cheese didn't really provide much, other than him finding the secret tunnels, which I think must play a part later in the show at some point, with the fall of King's Landing. His scene with the brothel madam was, well, odd, but insightful into his psychology somewhat, namely his openness about the bullying he received as a child and how it's affected him, and then claiming he never meant to actually kill Lucerys, and that he regretted it. Now, I know this scene has caught many fans off guard, which is fair, as it does seemingly come out of nowhere, but I think we can learn a lot about Aemond via his relationship with the brothel madam, namely his childlike demeanour and wish for comfort from a motherly figure. It seems to me a lot of these things about how he feels, his bullying, his guilt over Luke's death, and so on, are conversations he wants to be having with his own mother, Alicent. But as she's clearly emotionally unavailable to her children somewhat, which is not surprising given the circumstances of their birth, he is filling that void with this brothel madam. Now in terms of the sexual side of it, I think that's another matter altogether, and I'm interested to see where they're going to go with Aim in the rest of the season. As we know, Rook's Rest is going to shift his character a lot, so I'm going to wait and see if there's any payoff before I judge this scene too harshly. I really like they are fleshing out the Dragon Seas this early in the season, so when it does come time for the sewing, we as viewers have some emotional connection to them. Moving Hugh from Dragonstone to King's Landing was also a good move, considering Dragonstone in the show is considerably smaller and missing that native population like in the book. I do wonder who his father could be though. I have a gut feeling, given his age, it could potentially be Balon the Brave, Viserys and Daemon's father, but I don't think we'll ever know this. I already really like the vibe we're getting from Adam and Alan of Hull. And given their ages in the show, and the fact they're clearly not 14 and 15, I think it indicates they are going to be the bastard sons of Corlys Velaryon, rather than giving us the ambiguity we get in the book 
with them possibly being Lainords. I am a little confused, as in the show, Alan seems to be older than Adam. I might be wrong, but it seems like they've swapped the ages around, so Alan is now the elder brother. It's a bit of an odd one, and a change I don't really see the point in, as it seems very unnecessary. Maybe we'll get some more clarification about this later. Now, I want to circle back to the main issue of Egon killing the rat catchers. Namely, while it does happen in the book, it makes no sense the way the show has laid out the logic. You could have easily have brought the rat catchers to blood and have him identify Cheese. Or hell, I'm fairly sure Helena could have pointed him out. While the same logic does apply in the book somewhat as well, the vagueness and ambiguity kind of masks the issue. But hey, at the end of the day, we got what we all wanted. Hashtag justice for Cheese's dog. One of the biggest issues a lot of people have taken with blood and cheese was the lack of guards in the living quarters. And it's nice to see the writers were aware of this, and thus why I found the confrontation between Cole and Sir Eric so interesting. Because Eric was right. Where was Kristen? Him being a bed is a bit of a cop-out excuse. Why does Helena, the Queen, not have her own swamp protector? Something Cole, as Lord Commander, should have dealt with. Yet, Alicent, the Dowager Queen, is protected day and night by none other than the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard himself. I like Kristen Cole as a character in the book somewhat, but to me, this TV show version is not the Kristen Cole from the book. I really despise the show's take on Cole and cannot help but roll my eyes whenever the man is on screen, which is a shame because I do like Fabian Frankel as an actor, and for the most part, I think he did a very good job during season one. I know the idea they're going for with Cole is that he's a huge hypocrite, but the sheer amount of hypocrisy is just starting to get ludicrous. Even the most hypocritical person in the world at least has some self-awareness of what they're doing, but Cole is just a walking hypocrite at this point. The mental gymnastics and gaslighting he needed to guilt Sir Eric into a clear suicide mission lost any shred of respect I had for the character, which is a crying shame they went so hard down this road. You could have done some really compelling stuff with the moral complexity of Cole, and it kind of just been wasted in a way. And frankly, I can't wait to see him be used as target practice at the butcher's ball at this point. The scene with Otto being replaced as hand by Egon was wonderful. The acting by all involved was top tier, and you really get to see the sheer frustration from Otto that his plans 20 years in the making have all effectively come under done by the wild card that is Egon. But what is interesting about this argument is I can see points from both perspectives where they are both in the right somewhat. I understand Otto's frustration with Egon, but I can also sympathise Egon's need for action and revenge, given all that's happened with blood and cheese. I love how Otto calls Cole's plan to send Sir Eric to Dragonstone to kill Rhaenyra because he looks like his twin brother a prank. But what's so ironic about this is that that stupid prank of a plan very well almost worked. The scene in the aftermath of Otto losing his place as hand, where he's talking to Alicent, might be much more important than it first appears. Yes, we finally get the dare or name drop we've all been waiting for. But more importantly, I think it indicates that the writers are going to greatly expand Otto's story for a while, with us maybe getting to see some of Old Town at some point, with Otto being a point of view in the South. I've seen some go as far to suggest he could take some of Hobbit Hightower's role from the book, which, to be honest, I don't actually hate. Now, the duel of the Cargill twins is exactly what I hoped it would be, taking some elements from both accounts from the book, but adding their own twist to it. The tension as Arik moved through the castle was well done, and the confrontation between the two brothers was heart-wrenching. I love the fact they went with the I love you brother version of events, while also mixing in some elements of Mushroom's accounts of events. The fight itself was well choreographed, among the best I've seen in House of the Dragons so far, and in fact a lot of Game of Thrones. What I love about the Cargill twins is they are a really good way of showing the effects of a civil war can have, even dividing two twin brothers. The twist at the end of Eric killing himself did actually catch me off guard, I was thinking they were maybe going to go down the route of him taking a few days to die of his wounds. But all in all, it was a great sequence. I won the very few times as a book purist. I think the show did a really good job bringing it to screen. They used a lot of the dialogue from the book in this fight. In fact, you can see that throughout the whole episode, which is something that I think was quite lacking in season one, with many iconic one-liners from the book not making it into the show for some reason. I want to end this review by talking about the situation between Alicent and Kristen Cole. And frankly, 
exactly how much I've come to hate it. On paper, I didn't have the negative reaction to the idea of it that most viewers did when it got leaked. There were some hints of it in season one, and I thought that we're maybe going to do some interesting things with it, but it's just overshadowing so much. In two episodes, we've had three sex scenes, and a handful of scenes with them brooding, but it's more than just the needless sex scenes, but more the way it's impacting other parts of the story negatively. Think about all this screen time we've been spending with this relationship that could have been spent developing other characters. We could have seen Helena and Dreamfire burning Jaehaerys in the Dragon Pit, or maybe some more scenes between Egon and Helena. There is so much we could have seen rather than this. But the bit that's left me scratching my head is to what end is it for? We know how this story ends. We know soon Cole will march on Harrenhal with it actively damaging the character of Cole and Alicent. What's the point of all this going to be? I hope the writers have some kind of twist to it or plan, but frankly I don't have hope. I've seen a lot of talk about the moment Alicent sees Egon crying and her just leaving him to sleep with Cole and how out of character this is. But to me, given the context we have in the scene with Aemond in the brothel, her inability to comfort Egon and her cold nature when dealing with Helena before the funeral, to me indicates the writers are maybe trying to set up some kind of disconnect between Alicent and her children. To what end, I'm not sure, but perhaps as a reflection of the fact this is a path in life she's been forced to follow and is not one she would have chosen in any way and maybe this distance and coldness represents that but I'm going to see how this all plays out before I decide how I feel. In all, this episode was much better than last week. I want to give it a fair 8 out of 10. But I must note, without the wonderful performances from the whole cast, I think it would be closer to a 7. The dialogue is much improved this week and flowed really well. I know Sarah Hess who wrote this episode got a lot of flack for episode 9 last season, specifically the dragon pit scene. But her writing this episode seems a lot better, but only time will tell if that holds up. We still have 6 episodes to go. What did you guys think of the episode? How do you feel about some of the changes to the book? And what did you think of the duel of the Cargill twins? Did it live up to the hype? Let me know in the comments.